Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon. I'm Dan Rundy. I'm a senior vice president here at CSIS. I'm so pleased to be hosting Mr. James Heapy, who's a, is it Heapy? That's correct. It's yeah. a member of parliament, but is also a, the undersecretary for, uh, of, of the armed forces of the, of the United Kingdom. We're going to have a conversation today about southern blindness a view from the UK on Chinese and Russian influence in the global south. I think this is a great topic. This event will last 60 minutes. Uh, following the minister's remarks and a moderated discussion, we'll field a few questions from the audience. Uh, please submit questions by clicking on the Ask Live Questions button on the event webpage. So again, good afternoon. We're going to be talking about southern blindness, a view from the UK on Chinese and Russian influence in the global south. At the end of the day, to the extent that the United Kingdom, the United States, and the West leaves a vacuum, Russia and China are going to fill that vacuum, whether it's security, whether it's values, whether it's vaccines, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's digital, whether it's trade, uh, so, and whether it's security. So we have to be vigilant and we have to think differently about how we engage in the developing world, in the global south. And so I'm so pleased uh, that the minister is with us today to talk about this very pressing and important issue. I've had dozens of conversations in the last year about increasing uh, Russian and Chinese malign influence in the global south, especially in Latin America, an area that I spend a lot of time covering, but also in Africa, in the South Pacific, in Southeast Asia. And so I think it's a very appropriate topic for the minister to be joining us to be, to be speaking about. In Latin America and the Caribbean, Chinese investment pulls diplomatic support away from democratic allies such as Taiwan and upholds anti-democratic regimes while Russia puts weapons in the hands of the corrupt Maduro regime. For example, uh, China's activities in the South China Sea have flirted with direct military confrontations while both China and Russia have subverted international norms in, Ar in Antarctica and increased competition there. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated extra hemispheric interference in the Southern Hemisphere and around the globe. So a failure to take realistic stock of military, economic, and health capabilities or a failure to address disparate goals presents risks for both the United Kingdom and the United States as well as the global south to effectively counter malign influence and win the great, win great power competition currently playing across the globe, liberal democracies such as the United Kingdom and the United States must make a better offer than that being provided by China and Russia. So uh, Minister James Heapy is going to be with us to, to make, um, make some comments about this and have a conversation with us. He's had an illustrious career in public service and in the military. He served in the British military from 2004 to 20, 2012 where he attained the rank of major. Um, he also uh, has been a member of parliament since 2015. I'm really pleased to be hosting him. The special relationship still matters, Minister, and any time a uh, representative of the government of the United Kingdom comes to CSIS, they always are going to have a warm welcome here. I'm so pleased you're with us today. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, I mean, I'm conscious you've, your introduction has done it. The conversation is had. We should go to Sorry. questions. No, no, <laughs> but, but I mean, I think that this is, um, this is quite a timely discussion because my, the advantage of being the deputy, or maybe the disadvantage of being the deputy, is that my job, I guess, is to go around and uh, worry about the MOD, the Ministry of Defence's yes. activities, in the places that aren't in that sort of top tier of threat, that aren't in that top tier of, uh, of, of, of our alliances. Um, and when you look at how the MOD in London, I think the DOD here, and many other uh, ministries of defense uh, for our allies around, around the world have been viewing the Russia, Russian and Chinese threat. It's still very much a Russian threat that is in the North Atlantic and on continental Europe, and it is a Chinese threat that is within the first and second island chains 
in the Pacific. But actually, as I've been going around the Caribbean and South America, and as I've been going around uh, Africa and Central Asia uh, and South Asia, you see that we are being challenged in a very unspectacular way, but every single day there is a challenge to uh, our national interest. And I think what I would offer up front is that five challenges, there are more, but just five to kind of illustrate my point. Um, firstly, fishing. Uh, that's a sort of, it's, just, it's an industry that a lot of people don't give a second thought to. Certainly not a kind of uh, a strategic threat. But if you look at how, just from the economic perspective, illegal fishing is plundering the wealth of countries that rely on that industry for a big part of their economy, particularly in places like the South Pacific, um, that is a big strategic threat, and we have to work out whether or not we are going to partner with those countries uh, in, as a Western alliance in order to stand up for their uh, economic area. But actually, some of the fishing activity is, I would argue, more malign and more strategically significant. The existence of uh, Chinese fishing fleets off the north of Somalia and the, uh, the effort to buy up the fishing rights north of Somalia, well, that effectively gives the Chinese a constant presence in the waters approaching the Bab al-Mendeb, one of the big global choke points through which a huge amount of global trade flows. Similarly, the presence of Chinese fishing fleets based in Ushuaia, uh, in uh, Patagonia, in Argentina, well, that is, that is a Chinese presence on Cape Horn. And when I talk about the Caribbean in a second, all of a sudden you start to see that both of the US's routes from the Atlantic to the Pacific or the other way around potentially are, are under threat. So, you know, there's an economic, but also quietly, there is a military strategic thing going on there as influence in strategic waters around the world becomes more of a thing. Minerals. I, you know, the UK had an empire that became a commonwealth that uh, the, 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 the journey of that was around uh, gold, silver, precious metals, then tobacco and crops, and then oil and gas. Actually, the places that I would argue that you need to have your strategic relationships for the latter part of this century are the places where there are the biggest reserves of cobalt and lithium. We don't have any interest in the Congo, we never really have, and yet actually beneath the Congo Basin are some of the biggest deposits of rare earth metals. And my question is, if we take our eye off the ball and in the first part of this century, before we have properly digitized and electrified and in the process of decarbonizing our economies, and we've not noticed that the global supply chains have become dominated by our adversaries because they own all of the mineral rights in the places where these rare earths are most abundant, I start to ask myself a question about well, what makes you truly sovereign? If in the last century your ability to bend steel and build submarines and your ability to have access to oil and gas was what made you sovereign, in the back half of this century are you sovereign if you don't have an assured route to access for the things that you need to be able to build uh, for an electrified economy. Uh, ports and basing, you know, you just, um, we take for granted, I think, that for more than a generation now, the West's militaries, the US militaries in particular, have had complete domination in the, sky, in the air, complete domination at sea. Uh, if the US wanted sea control anywhere it liked, it was a given. The US wanted air control in it was given. Your ability to leverage basing and overflight was incredible because you were the global hegemon. That quietly but surely is being chipped away at. I look at the fact that the Chinese offered to build the Sri Lankan support, the Sri Lankans couldn't service the debt, so now the Chinese own the port. Entebbe Airport in Uganda is uh, potentially on a very similar journey where the Chinese build the airport, the Ugandans can't service the debt, the Chinese are threatening to seize the airport because they're unwilling to service the debt. 
The Chinese have built ports or operate ports at Gwadar in Pakistan, in Dukham in Oman, in Djibouti, and so all of a sudden they have a combination of overland and sea routes that mean they can bypass the global choke points that we depend on, and they can get those minerals and the, uh, and the, 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 the assets that they've acquired in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, into China through a new Silk Road, through their Belt built and Road initiative, and they do that by just quietly but consistently getting the leverage and the ownership and the development of facilities that they need to service uh, their economy. But I think there's something more sinister going on because if you look at the Russians in Port Sudan and if you look at the Russians in Tartus in Syria and if you look at the persistent Russian desire for reports on the northern coast of Libya. Well, that is a triangle either side that spans the Suez Canal that potentially gives Russia the ability to base ships, but also other access, uh, uh, anti-access area denial systems on the approaches to Suez, which holds a key global supply chain at risk. By the same token, when I was at Southcom in Miami, they were sort of showing me how Chinese, Chinese influence in the Western Caribbean, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, in Honduras, you start to see that increasingly that, that influence, could that over time as the Chinese develop it, start to hold the approaches to the Panama Canal at risk for the, uh, for the US? Put that in the context of the conversation we were having two seconds ago about fishing rights off the south coast of Patagonia, and all of a sudden both Cape Horn and Panama potentially are routes that are not uh, without their risks for the US. You have to fight your way into the Pacific, potentially. And all because, bit by bit, incrementally, seemingly, uh, seemingly innocuous acts of diplomacy or development or, um, or military relationships or access to fishing or mineral rights have put the US, the UK, and our allies in a place where we don't have the influence in strategic parts of the world. Moreover, we already have a resurgent Russia flowing submarines through the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap into the North Atlantic. But I look at the Chinese building a port at Walvis Bay in Namibia, the Chinese potentially building a port in Gabon, the Chinese have been putting huge pressure on the Uruguayans to build a port at Montevideo. At Walvis Bay, it looks suspiciously like the spec that the Chinese have built to in Namibia is a port that would be capable of holding nuclear submarines. So now we've got a resurgent Russia bringing nuclear submarines into the North Atlantic and the Chinese potentially on a journey to being able to operate submarines in the South Atlantic. That creates an extraordinary problem set for NATO. All of a sudden, when European countries talk about a tilt to the Indo-Pacific to meet the Chinese threat, well, actually, is the Chinese threat going to appear in the Atlantic because it would appear that they have the ambition to bring it there. Um, fourthly, proxies. I think that there is a worrying trend for our adverse, particularly Russia, to use proxies to gain influence in countries, to solve internal security problems that the West would tie itself in knots uh, with engaging for. The Central African Republic is a great example of somewhere where you know, there's been a UN mission there for years. And then Wagner turns up at the invitation of the CAR. The, 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 the Russian mercenary group. The Russian mercenary group, exactly. And, and what is claimed is a complete inverting of the security situation where the Central African Republic goes from 90% insurgency, 10% governed, to 90% governed, 10% insurgency. Now, everybody would dispute that version of events, but, that, but the perception in the CAR is that that is what Wagner has achieved. And only this week in Mali, we are seeing exactly the same. Wagner have been in Mali for less than three months. Everybody was warning the Malians against doing it. Uh, I sat there myself in Bamako and said, look, you know, you, this is gonna, you're, 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 you're mortgaging yourself in a way that you can't afford. The cost of Wagner coming here, the cost of Wagner trying to sort out your security situation is that in 30 years' time, all of your mineral rights are owned by Russia. Well, the mindset of the junta is, well, in 30 weeks' time, there might have been another coup, or Mali might, uh, might not exist. And so, out of expediency, they've turned to what appears to be an answer where they ask no questions about human rights, they ask no questions about, uh, about democratic accountability. It's an easy answer to a really hard solution. 
but what's happening in Mali with the French ambassador being kicked out of Bamako yesterday is that actually Russia now has a leverage. And at a time of heightened geopolitical tension between Russia and the West, Russia is able to disrupt in a 360 way. It's not just about Ukraine. They're pulsing stuff through into the North Atlantic and they are causing problems for the international community in sub-Saharan Africa where we are finding that we are losing influence and have to quickly reimagine a security situation. And then finally, debt. And we, you know, the US, I think, is in a better place than the UK in this, in terms of your ability and your willingness to uh, fund development projects. But we should be clear that the number of countries around the world that now have enormous debt to, you know, the United States' pacing threat, the UK, we now, in our defense review, we've defined China as a competitor. But, you know, we are now in a place where if the chips start to fall, the leverage that China has in country after country after country around the world should really keep us awake at night. It is a strategic threat to our influence. And even if those countries wanted to continue in their loyalty and their natural predisposition towards the West, the reality is, is that they might find themselves unable to do that because of the position that they're in. Now, I, every single thing that I've said in the last five minutes, none of it in and of itself really moves the dial. It's kind of small, incremental activity. But continuously, over a decade or more, if those are the things that are happening in the parts of the world where we consider ourselves to have an interest, where, where we, that could be strategically important at time of crisis, and we don't wake up to the fact that we need to be competing just as persistently, then we could find ourselves in a place where the other side has the advantage. So how do we, how do, we do that? Well, first of all, we have to be honest about the fact that even the US, with the biggest navy on the planet and the biggest economy on the planet, you can't be everywhere all of the time. And the UK certainly can't either. So the Western Alliance has got to work this out about how we burden share around the world. Moreover, this isn't just a military challenge. Much of what I have just described, the response to it day in, day out, is nothing to do with the MOD or the DOD. It is a whole-of-government response that is required to deal with it. Thirdly, I think we have to redefine partnership. We have been able to just bank on the fact that the United States and the West is the only show in town. It's not now. These countries have a choice. So what is our offer to them? What is our ability to engage with them as equals and partners, not just assume that they will automatically want to be in our club? And finally, we need to make the choice about more than security and development. The choice needs to be about values. In the Cold War, people like me were completely comfortable talking about an ideology of freedom, of democracy. We're out of the habit of doing that now. If you say to most countries in sub-Saharan Africa that you know, the offer is around security or, and or development, with all of the caveats that the West has to apply, we won't win. But if we say to those countries that we are a partner with whom you can operate without fear that we will exploit you, we will operate alongside you as an ally, as a friend, as a partner, and that we will stand up alongside you for the things that we share as values, then I think that becomes an offer that is far more compelling. And I think we politicians need to get back into the habit about talking about freedom. Amen. That was fantastic. Minister, that was great. I've been waiting to have a conversation like this for a really long time. I, I, everything you said resonated with me. Several things I've taken away, and then I've got a couple questions for you, Minister. One is, is we've got to do a better job of burden sharing. We, no one can do this alone. The United States can't do this alone. These are big, thorny problems, and we're going to have to work across um, all of, our, all of our countries in the West. This is also still about values. It's not just about security. So let me start with the, the first question, which is, okay, the other thing I'm taking away is paying attention. The, the, the topic you, we've brought today is about southern blindness. Talk about why or how it's so difficult to get 
your leaders or my leaders here in this country, whether it's Africa or the Americas or the Pacific Islands, all the places you've talked about, places like you, I'm, I've made a specialty of kind of countries that are kind of one level down, develop, mainly developing countries. I was in at USAID in the Bush administration. I was at the World Bank Group. I've been here for more than 11 years. And in my personal capacity, I've done some outside advisory work for some political campaigns on foreign policy issues. So, but it's very difficult to get governments to pay attention when you've got front page news and things like Ukraine. These, of course, it's important, Iran or North Korea. Oftentimes, we can't get leaders to focus on the Africa or the Americas unless there's an emergency or a crisis. How, how, do, you, how do you get leaders to pay attention? Isn't that, isn't that part of the dilemma for democracies like the United Kingdom or the United States? Well, we, we, we have to force ourselves to. I mean, I, I, this is an analogy that we we'll struggle to translate because your version of football is is different to ours. <laughs> but, but my son is nine years old. So we'll go with soccer. In junior soccer, football, yeah. uh, the, they all just follow the ball. They all run yeah, yeah. around and, they the, you know, the ball. and where the ball is, all yeah, 20 yeah, yeah. of them are within six yards. And, and I want you to know we are grateful for the great export from the United Kingdom of football, yeah. of <laughs> soccer. My wife is from Argentina, and so we follow soccer or football, football as we call it, very carefully. So the analogy works very well yes. for me, Minister. Well, you know, and the, 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 the ball, if you like, in that analogy, is straight east and straight west. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to design a military, design a security and foreign policy, you look at, well, which are the adversaries that pose us the greatest threat? And I think you naturally look at the, uh, the, the way through which they cause you the most direct threat. And that naturally leads you to want to do something about your ability to counter the Northern Fleet in the North Atlantic. It makes you want to worry about your ability to stand up to a challenge, on the, a land challenge on the European continent. For the UK and for European powers and for the US, increasingly, it makes you focus on how you would contain China within the second island chain um, at time of crisis there. We, you, we've got to start being more honest with ourselves. As I said in my, my opening remarks, and I, I don't think that there's anything, um, anything, any one thing that you point to as totemic. That's the problem. It's kind of imperceptible in the way that it happens it's day after day after day. But the countries who perhaps feel this most acutely, Australia, New Zealand, they live this day in, day out. And if yep. you speak to the Aussies and the Kiwis, they see this challenge all the time. You know, the, the volcano explosion in Tonga the other yes. day. Minister, you know, tell me about, you had a boat, you had a, a ship nearby. We had a ship a couple of days away, thank heavens, because Tonga is an important con country in the Commonwealth. We have a great relationship. It matters to us. Um, but if we didn't have HMS Spey where she was, we would have been relying on the Australian and the New Zealand Navy to have been there and delivered on, on our behalf. Chinese planes were landing within hours to deliver aid. Now that stuff, it just creates a perception. Well, who are our friends? Who are the people who really come to our aid at time of need? I saw fantastic imagery of Japanese aid arriving. I'm sure that USAID have been there as well. But actually, that's the competition that, that now matters. And making sure that in the parts of the world where you have an interest in the parts of the world where you want to compete, that you have a presence that allows you to compete. That's really important. But to my point, you can't be everywhere all the time, no matter how big you are, and hence the need to, to burden share and work out how we're going to do this as a Western alliance. So you were in, you were in Colombia recently in the yeah. last six months. You also were in the, in the Caribbean. Yeah. So talk a, you, you mentioned it a little bit, but I, I get the sense when I talk to my friends in in South America and the Caribbean that they also share some of these concerns. Our, our friends, our, your friends, our friends share these, concern, these same concerns. The things that you've put on the table are things that they're worried about too and they're seeing and you've, you've described some of them. But um, I think about um, vaccine diplomacy. Yep. I think about that the, you know, the, the United Kingdom has been very generous with its development assistance on things like responding on, on COVID. Um, but I think that we've got a, a series of challenges um, 
in, in South America. Talk, talk a little bit about some, some, and certainly fishing was another one that you talked about. I'm sure that, I mean, that, it's not something people don't think about, but it's very, very important. No, I mean, I, and I think that uh, uh, in Latin America, the, the thing that most people worry about uh, in Europe is the flow of drugs. Yeah. So most of the European effort in places like Colombia and in the Caribbean is around counter-narcotics. I think the US Coast Guard, that's their principal reason for being there as well, and the migration threat as well. Um, but actually, there are state actors increasingly gaining influence in your backyard. Uh, and, you know, they are... Um, and they're, they're gaining that influence because they are uh, offering opportunities for development. I mean, just, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a colonial example that I suspect sure. will get little sympathy in America. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, Barbados is, yeah. you know, people call it Little England. I mean, it is a place where Brits go all the time. British tourism is a big part yep. of their economy. Uh, it is... Uh, you know, there's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful affection for the UK. Yep. And yet China has gone in there under our nose, struck up a relationship, uh, and we've just found ourselves in a position where they've chosen to change their head of state. And that's fine. They're a sovereign country. That's absolutely fine. But that is indicative of a loss of influence. And if you look at what the Chinese are building in Barbados, it's really ambitious. So. You know, in, in places that we have regarded as kind of the, the, the countries that we hold dearest, the countries where the relationship is so close, in many ways the relationship is every bit as close, but someone has just come in like a cuckoo in the nest and has eroded our influence. And then further westwards, you know, places where the U.S. has always been a bit worried, where you put in a huge effort with your DEA and your Coast Guard to, to worry about drugs. Actually, in those very same countries, there is a growing influence that I think poses you a strategic threat because your access to the Panama Canal potentially over time becomes compromised if influence from Russia and China and Venezuela, Nicaragua, Honduras, uh, other places like that, you know, grows to the point where they get basing rights. So I think we're not paying enough attention. I think we could imagine a scenario where Russia had a military base in the Western Hemisphere or in the Caribbean. That's not impossible. No. Imagine a scenario where China had a... I worry about a couple things with China in the military sense. One is in the Western Hemisphere. One is imagine them having some sort of an actual straight-up base along the lines of a, a string of pearls along the line of what you were describing earlier, Minister. But also I worry about if you let's say you had a financially unstable country say argentina that said well maybe we can't strike a deal with the imf so maybe we'll strike a financial deal with china and china says okay that's fine but what we'd really like um are some dual use ba naval bases in the south atlantic uh in exchange for that and i think that you know we've seen uh, countries like Russia play kind of pseudo IMF in places like Cyprus or attempt to do that. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that a, a, a country that was in financial straits could, could seek assistance from Russia or China in exchange for some sort of a, a basing arrangement. I don't think that's crazy. It, it's happening already. I mean, it, you know, it is... Um, the, the Chinese have been in Djibouti for a while. Um, the Chinese have been building a base in the UAE, uh, which potentially could have been very sizable indeed. I think the Emiratis have been um, persuaded, in the short term at least, to, um, to, to, to stop that. But I'm sure one of your correspondents yeah. will tell me that's not the case. Um, they, but if you look all the way down the East African coast, you know, the way that the, 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 the constant offers to build deep sea container ports. Now, make no mistake, I, you know, the, the primary reason for them wanting to do that will be that they have uh, ever larger interests in sub-Saharan Africa and that you know, facilitates their route to market. But just look at Wolvis Bay in Namibia. It's an example that I've I drawn in my remarks yeah. earlier on. Uh, lots of people very unfamiliar with it, but it is a very high spec deep sea container port built by the Chinese for the, Namib for the Namibians uh, 
Um, well, it's a very I mean, nice country. I mean, it's a very peaceful place. Very love. Very well. Rel very in, in ter of the 54 sub-Saharan African countries, a very desirable country with a high, relatively high levels of development. Absolutely, but it is built to a spec where you could very easily see warships operate from it. Now, and the Namibian government will say that's not what it's for. It's a commercial port, but that's not the point. It's been built by the Chinese. I don't know what the debt arrangement is, but I bet you that yeah. if you don't keep up the payments, then they'll be calling it back in pretty quickly. Just like in Sri Lanka. And, and you, and you, yeah, exactly. And then you move further up the West African coast into the Gulf of Guinea. You look at Chinese influence in Gabon and enthusiasm for building uh, a port there, likewise Equatorial Guinea. Move further on round and you see sort of influence all the way across littoral West Africa. Um, you know, that's, we should worry about that. If they're working, you know, if, if, if Chinese influence on the Atlantic coast of South America and Chinese influence on the Atlantic coast uh, of Africa is, is working, its, sorry, of South America and Africa is you know, working its way northwards. That's a strategic challenge to the US. It doesn't, right, it doesn't seem as if that just happened by mistake. It no. strikes me as it happens that, you know, seems purposeful. Well, it, 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 it happens because I just think that we've been, we've been very focused on Iraq and Afghanistan yes. and the, those campaigns or the post, the the first post Cold War. Years. Yeah, and, you know, and, and, and we remain, this is just a different way. The, the economy is more globalized. The, world, the global economy is, is more interconnected. It's globalized. Um, the, you know, this is different to the Cold War. It's not just about having spheres of influence that represent votes in the UN, although votes in the UN matter, by the way. Yeah, and absolutely. all of these tiny countries where China is buying up fishing rights or is building the port or is building the airport or is building, uh, uh, you know, helping to fund new infrastructure. Uh, that, is, that is leverage that before we know it, the international system that is a system that underpinned by rules-based um, international order and, uh, and, and emphasizes the importance of freedom and democracy and, and human rights, all of a sudden, there's no majority for that anymore in the fora that matter. And that's a real challenge to the values that we hold dear. I, I completely agree. We just did a big study looking at leadership races in the multilateral system. There's, a, there's about 200, there's more than that, but there are about 200 multilateral organizations that matter. And I would argue there's about 30 that I would describe as the commanding heights of the multilateral system. But I don't want a Chinese or a Russian-led IMF. I don't want a Chinese or Russian-led WTO. I don't want a Chinese or Russian-led WIPO. Now, if you put a gun to my head three years ago and said, what the heck is WIPO, minister? I wouldn't have been able to tell you, and I'm a fairly well-read person, but it, the World Intellectual Property Organization is sort of the FIFA, maybe that's, I don't know if that's the right, <laughs> the, FIFA, the FIFA of the intellectual property world. And the Chinese put forward a very attractive and qualified candidate. They are putting forward very serious and real candidates for real jobs. And thankfully, the West got its act together and, and, and realized that there was an issue. We had our, our clocks cleaned. I don't know if you have that term in the United Kingdom. We got beat very badly uh, on the race for the FAO. Now, I think the FAO is about standards, about what, what counts as food and what doesn't count as food. They also are, a pick, they are also one of the, 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 the deciders about who runs the World Food o Program. The World Food Program is sort of the United Nations Air Force, in addition to being an, a food aid agency. And the Chinese won that race, and that was a sobering thing here in Washington. I think we, many Republicans, I'm a Republican, Many Republicans like to virtue signal and say, oh, that multilateral stuff, it's useless, or, you know, there's a whole series of complaints on the right on, on, among conservatives in the United States about the multilateral system. Yeah, they're mean to Israel, they are going to take our guns away, we can't spank our kids anymore, um, they, they have all sorts of funny values, or they don't pay their, their parking tickets at the, at the United Nations, and what's the point? or they're going to impinge on our sovereignty. So there's like a whole spectrum of sort of fears that are projected onto them. Well, when China beat, beat us very soundly, a U.S.-backed uh, candidate in the FAO for, during the Trump administration, I think that was a complete wake-up call for the Trump administration, that we couldn't, that the United States, including Republicans, couldn't afford to ignore the multilateral system any longer. That, was, that the stakes were too high. 
Yeah. This was in 1995 anymore, in, whether it's in the security realm or the multilateral realm or the trade realm. Well, I mean, this is a... Um, the, the international community is an electorate. When it comes to uh, who gets to hold the influential jobs in international fora, the, the international community as an electorate needs to be schmoozed and shaped to Romanced. sympathize and yeah. uh, exactly and you know and, and sort of lazy politics is when you kind of blame the electorate for making silly decisions well no the electorate makes whatever decision it wishes to do and I I worry too that this this trend towards um, I don't want to call it nationalism but it's it's a sort of trend towards prioritizing the national interest. Build a wall. To the exclusion. Build, yeah. Yeah. And and the and that is that is dangerous because what does that say to to the rest of the world? If all of a sudden that sort of shining fortress of, America of hope and democracy is no longer visible in their lives. And what and the, when it is visible, it's visible in a sort of negative way about sort of uh, asserting its interests to the exclusion of of others. That's not to my point about values. No, that is, that's not, that's not the flag of freedom that yeah. people want to rally around. And we won't, you know, the, 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 you, know you, can, you can muscle influence, you can build more ships than anybody else, you can spend more money on aid than anybody else, but that doesn't feel like a sustainable solution to this. Actually, what, what, what Putin and Xi are, are autocrats. Uh, they have no real concern for friendship, they're just vigorously uh, and belligerently pursue their own interest and the interest of a small number of, 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 of people around them. Well, are we going to play them at their own game or are we going to stand up and show how we're different and how if you work with us, what you get is a friendship and a partnership that endures and that brings you to the table with us as an equal? Amen. So, Mr. I have a couple more questions. I know, though, I suspect there may be some questions from the audience. I'm, I'm looking around, seeing if we've, I don't know if we've, we've had some or not, but uh, otherwise I could ask, I've got questions for you all day long, Minister, but I'd just say a couple of things. One is, I want to talk about education. So when I meet members, I, I've probably visited 100 countries in my career, many, most of them developing countries, the kind of countries that, you, that are in your portfolio now. And whenever I meet with leaders of these developing countries, I always ask, where do you, if you're not educating your, your, your son or daughter in this country, where are you sending them for university education or getting a master's degree or military education? I'm thinking about the United Kingdom's uh, excellent, you know, Sandhurst. And, and so could you talk a little bit about how the United Kingdom, I mean, I think the United Kingdom is a very, very, very attractive um, uh, poll for higher education. So could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's also an important source of influence and soft power that countries like the United States and the United Kingdom have. Could you, could you talk yeah, a little bit about that? Yeah, it is. I mean, I think that, that um, the, the esteem that your top universities, our top universities are held in by people in the developing world is a huge asset. We should be excited about the fact that they want to come, that, 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 that to them, the most obvious route to mobility in their own life is to have a degree or a postgraduate uh, qualification from a UK or US university. But that brings with it a discussion about how we do visas and immigration policy to make sure that people, people feel from around the world can, come. can come here. Want to come or feel welcome study. to yeah. come. Because, uh, you know, uh, what's, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, there are other countries, particularly China, where they are throwing open the door and they are open, offering scholarships and you know, really driving that agenda because it's, it's important soft power and it brings real leverage. Now, on military training, yeah, to your point there to, yeah. as well, you know, I, am, I am acutely aware that there are only, uh, you know, as, as, our, as our Army, Navy, Air Force gets smaller, which is right because technology means that you don't need as many people, but that means you have fewer courses per year, the courses that you run have fewer people on them, it, and you have to reduce proportionately the international components, otherwise you end up with running courses that are sort of 30 to 50 percent um, foreign candidates, and that means you lose, it's no longer the British Army, Royal Navy, Royal Air Force no. training thing. 
But that's a real problem because this is the currency. The number of militaries I visit around the world, that's where the want. first thing they say when you walk into the room is, I remember my time at Sandhurst, I remember my time at Dartmouth, I remember my time uh, on RCDS or at UK Staff College. And now, where is it that you can get places on Staff College uh, without, without any fear of refusal? It's in China. Um, you know, and that's, so all of a sudden, these militaries where they wear a uniform based on the Royal Navy or the British Army. They, their customs and traditions, the way that they do drill, is based on the British Army. And yet they are finding it easier to get their people to staff college in China than to get their people to staff college in the UK. That's a threat to us. So we have to think, the United States, the United Kingdom, we have to think, I think going back to this issue of burden sharing, I think we have to be more intentional across the West about this. Because we have only a certain number of slots, but I think this is very, very important. I love the point about speaking about freedom. I uh, grew up admiring Ronald Reagan, uh, Bush 41. I was an intern in Bush 41's administration. I worked on his re-election campaign as a volunteer in 1992. I served as, a, as an intern in the Bush 41 White House. Uh, I adored Bush 41. I loved working for Bush 43. I was very personally taken by Bush 43's second inaugural address about the freedom agenda. I'm very involved in democracy work. I'm on the board of something called the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, which is sort of the purple finger people to help set up the rules of the game for free and fair elections. They've operated in 100 countries, uh, has some Republicans on the board. Uh, uh, There's some Democrats on the board, and they have an international contingent of folks. So I'm very... Uh, very strongly moved by this issue of what you've put on the table. I completely agree with you. What I worry about is um, the 2008 financial crisis, um, some of the, let's call it the, the challenges domestically in this country we've had. I won't list them all. I think we all know what I'm talking about. Some of the challenges I say in the last five years, whether it's the you know, contestations of elections or afterwards, I still think at the end of the day, I'd rather be a democracy, I'd rather have rule of law, I'd ha rather have a free media, I'd rather have an attempt to try and do a better job of trying to support marginalized peoples and minorities. We don't do a, we don't do a perfect job, but I, I frankly think compared to say how China treats the Uyghurs or, you know, et cetera, I think we do a better job. And so I just would say that or, or religious freedom in, in China, which is, you know, I'm, I'm Catholic, and I think what they're doing to the Catholic Church is just terrible. So I, I, I think, but I, what I'm trying to say is I think that freedom and democracy have, and sort of the great, you know, the, the standard bearers, whether, the, certainly in the case of the United States, I, I don't think it's so much of a problem in the United Kingdom, but we've, we've taken a couple of lumps recently. How do we, how do we do a better job of speaking about these issues when we've had some we haven't had the, sort of the best days in the last couple of years. I'm, so, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I mean, that is almost the biggest challenge of, of all, that the countries that are the most free are the least aware of all of the advantage that that freedom brings them. You know, our, our public discourse is really toxic and toxic because people sort of don't believe that democracy is working. There are people in this country, a big proportion of people in this country, who deny the results of the last election. Joe, there, Joe there, Biden won the election. Of course he did. Of course he did. And there are, but, and there are people in this country... And I know it's preposterous to have to even say it, because well, there's a percentage of folks who... Joe Biden won the election. And, you know, and in, in the UK, the same, we are... You know, we are a tolerant, open, forgiving society, and yet month after month after month, we are tearing ourselves to shreds in, you know, in, 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 a, in a public discourse, discourse that is suggesting that somehow we are intolerant. Well, you've visited countries around the world. I've visited countries around the world where they don't have even a fraction of the freedom that we have, and yet, you know, I, I, you know, I say that we have to espouse a set of values. Politicians can't just do that through diplomacy. Our, our, you know, our own democracies, our own societies, our own 
uh, our own cultures have to be uh, a sort of beacon that other nations want to be a part of. If you're going to espouse the power of a set example. of values, yeah, how hollow do our words sound? If I go to a country or someone you know, who draws a bigger crowd than me goes to a country and gives a speech about freedom, and then the, the footage that they see on the TV is of riots over... Uh, some sort of intolerance around, uh, you know, yeah, the, how the somebody's been treated, or, or, or they watch they watch footage of people storming the capital, denying the result of an election. I mean, I just, uh, you know, and that, 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 that we're, we're 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 well beyond the brief of the minister for the armed forces, that's for sure. But I, um, I, I just there is a there is a real danger that if the West can't celebrate and enjoy all of the advantages that freedom is supposed to bring, and if young people are growing up in our societies believing that they are not free and they are not part of liberal tolerant democracies then how on earth do we fly that flag for those who we're trying to draw to our way of viewing the world compared to compared to the Chinese or Russian view all right so let me summarize a couple of things and then I see if you agree with me and then I got a couple of questions from the from our television audience so it strikes me is that we as the United Kingdom and the United States need to be paying closer attention to the global south. We just have to do it because of this age of great power competition. Uh, that neither the United Kingdom nor the United States nor our allies uh, can bear the challenges or burdens that are in front of us alone. That we're going to have to work together in a more burden sharing and more intentional way. A lot of what you've been talking about, Minister, is not about security, but security is important. That we got to get our collective houses in order to make sure that we are, you know, we can't give away what we don't got. And so to the extent we got to have, you know, I agree. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we want to have freedom and human rights and, and, and rule of law and that those are things that people should want to aspire to but to the extent that Russia and China are saying hey we got a better model and to the extent that they look on television and see challenges in Western countries like the United States or others it's it's harder to sell what what we're trying to sell right you got it okay so we probably need a collective Western agenda on minerals because decarbonization doesn't mean demineralization, Minister. No. We probably need a Western agenda on the digital, because the digital is the new electricity. And my fervent hope is that the developing world, the Global South, has not Huawei-free and ZTE-free digital, but we're going to have to get our act together on that. We probably need to have a Western agenda on environmental issues like illegal mining and fishing, that may not be as kind of on the agenda, but I agree with you, Minister, these are things we need to do a better job on. And fourth, it seems to me, Minister, that on ports and airports, um, we probably, there's just some things we just can't have the Russians and the Chinese building, and we need to enable an alternative, because if I'm a tin pot dictator in some developing country, um, no offense to tin pot dictators, but, if I'm a tin pot dictator and I got a choice of like a crappy built port and someone bribes me or no port, I'm going with a crappy built port and the bribe. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is. I think it is. But I, we have to be, you know, we, so we've got to find a vehicle through which we're able to invest. The, the UK actually has just um, reimagined the uh, Commonwealth uh, Investment Fund which has been a sort of Commonwealth development, um, been a long-standing sort of mechanism through which we've done a bit of sort of um, development funding, but not really... This isn't CDC, this isn't the Commonwealth Development Corporation. Yeah, exactly. It? CDC. Exactly, exactly. So we've just, we just... It's a very important institution. Well, it is, it is, but we've just, we've just given it a bit of a reboot yeah. because yeah. actually that should be our vehicle for competing. Yeah. You know, that should be that should be the UK's answer to how do you fund your port, how do you fund your 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 airport. I, I, I agree with that, Minister, and I think I think the the Commonwealth Development Corporation is a very important institution. I think what 
the UK has done on its development assistance, wh whether it's whatever the level is. I think the UK has been a very generous country in terms of its foreign assistance um, and has punched above its weight, not just in the security space, but in the development space. And I don't want to enter the argument about whether it's zero, whether 0.7% 0 is the right number or not. And I personally am of the view, and I'm in the development business, but I'd, I do think you know, I'd like to have, you know, I'd like having the U UK as a security partner as well. So I understand those are hard choices, so don't get me wrong. So I agree. I think that's right. So things like the CDC, we ought to be thinking about how we're crowding in things like sovereign wealth funds or pension funds or private capital. So, or using institutions, the EBRD or the Inter-American Development Bank, the African Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, all institutions the United Kingdom is a member of or a member of, shareholders of, we have influence. All right. So, so, but, so you're, are you sort of, what I've said you resonates with you, Minister? I do. I agree. I can see you've got some questions. But I, I, the other thing I, um, again, not in my brief, which always makes the team from the embassy nervous, but I, um, I, I also... You, you, Make you, them nervous. That's you, good. But you raised a really interesting point. So rare earth metals, yeah. inescapably part of the future economy. Totally. Inescapably necessary in an economy that's been decolonized. Yeah. But even m what I'd call meat and potatoes metals, Minister, because there's, two, there's 90 kilograms or 200 pounds of copper in the electric vehicle batteries of the te current technology today. That's a lot of copper, Minister. Absolutely. Our uh, environmental agendas can be so absolute Totally. But it's almost as if everything must remain in the ground. Well, you can't leave oil and gas in the ground and cobalt Amen. and lithium. Amen. Amen. So, 100%. So what is the, if, you know, if, I totally agree. if BP, Shell, Total, Elf, uh, Exxon uh, are, are the sort of, you know, a, a, a yesterday's company yeah. is we're going to leave oil and gas in the ground. Actually, what is the one of the things I think will be really interesting discussion is what are the what are the what are the standards to which we hold Western mining companies so that when so that so the offer is to the African country with really big cobalt yeah. reserves that we will come in and a, a Western mining company will be held to a standard that means that your cobalt, your lithium, your rare earths are extracted in an environmentally sensitive way rather than a Chinese or Russian mining company that may not be held to the same standards. Now, the danger is that in the UK, the simple, or, or in the US, the, uh, 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 even a whiff of a discussion about mining in the Congo Basin leads to an absolute response of leave it in the ground. But, but one way or the other, those minerals will end up being exploited because the economy of the back end of this century requires it. I, I, I believe every developing country in the world, if they have oil, gas, or mineral wealth, or forest wealth, or fishing wealth, are going to exploit them. And so we have to choose what rules of the game are going to be. They're going to be exploited. I, I, I believe the argument of some that say leave these assets in the ground are not being realistic well, because you, they're asking these poor countries. You, you cannot decarbonize the global economy, yeah. unless you are going to massively, by an order you of magnitude. You better love mining in a deep, profound uh, way. Totally. On, on, you so better put mining so, on steroids. So let's regulate the mining, the, you know, Western mining companies, let's get them to a place where they're doing it in a way that we think is yeah. environmentally sound. But I, I, one of the interesting things is, is I think our policies in aid agencies, our policies in multilateral development banks, our policies with development finance institutions like the Commonwealth Development Corporation. I'm not sure where the CDC is on this issue. It's not clear to me that, I think, let me put it this way, at the very most, it's sort of lukewarm enthusiasm for development finance institutions to focus on minerals, mining. It's not high on the agenda. And I don't think this mining discussion has been priced into the climate change conversation in any kind of serious way. I am. So I, I, I suspect that you know, at COP26 there was plenty of opprobrium for anything that BP or Shell sponsored. Um, but I bet you that if BHP Billiton or Anglo-American or Rio Tinto had been sponsoring anything, there'd be similar opprobrium. And yet, and yet actually the mining companies perversely are of the roots to decarbonization, inescapably so. De decarbonization does not mean dematerialization. That means we're going to have to draw minerals out of the ground. Yeah. Full stop. All right, so I got some questions for you, Minister. All right, first question, are you concerned with Russia's presence, influence in Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua? Uh, this is, uh, you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I am, yes. I mean, I, I'm less concerned, I suppose, than Russian presence in Libya and 
Mali because the Sahel and the ungoverned space in southern Libya is a more immediate threat to the UK's interest and, and sort of European interests. But for exactly the reasons that I'm very nervous about Russian presence there in our southern flank, I think the US should be very nervous about Russian presence in, in the Caribbean. And it is, in ex it is undeniably there and it's meaningfully there. And, you know, if, if to, to, to my point earlier on about the 360 challenge that Russia, I think, is trying to create for the West by, you know, causing difficulty in Mali, pulsing stuff out into the North Atlantic, um, you know, agitating uh, potentially in, uh, in the Middle East uh, and in the Caucasus, um, uh, you know, they, if they wanted to, they've probably got more than enough influence now in Venezuela, particularly, where... Nicaragua you know, as well. You could find yourselves with Russian basing pretty quickly in the Caribbean, and that... that I, I think we haven't thought this through. We have been a little bit kind of sleepwalking through this. I think this is really a, a serious issue. I yeah. agree with you, Minister. We are not paying attention. The other thing is you're seeing... Uh, from Venezuela, I think the you know, Russian assistance to, you know, I also think you've had Russian interference in elections in the Western Hemisphere, not just in the United States, which was a thing, but all over the world, including yep. in, uh, in Europe, but also in the, in the Western Hemisphere as well. And, and in, you know, so I think this continues to be a challenge. So I, I share your concern, Minister. But here's another question. What more can the United Kingdom do in the Sahel against hostile state activity? Well, I mean, the difficulty is that uh, the Sahel countries themselves, I don't think the UK has a lot of interest. Uh, it is, um, you know, most of it is francophone, and so France, to their enormous credit, has been leading the effort. In the burden share. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, and, and, and hats off to the French. That is a huge commitment over the best part of a decade uh, to, you know, be the framework nation for what is now the world's leading largest counterterrorism effort. I think what the UK more realistically would do, uh, in addition to our commitment to the UN mission in Mali, is look at how we would reinforce against contagion into littoral West Africa. And I think if we were to look at that problem set alongside the French, uh, so Burkina Faso is heading in a very, very dangerous direction. Um, the coup, attempted coup last week or two weekends ago, um, I think is, uh, is just the start of it. Um, well, actually, Togo, Benin, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, um, you know, the Brits and the French, now's the time to get into those countries, get upstream of the contagion, help them to develop the security apparatus on their northern borders whilst the going is good, whilst the Ghanaian government, the Cote d'Ivoirean government has full control of the country, get in there now upstream of it and bulwark against the contagion. Right. And then you've got to ask yourself a question about how you get after... The, the chaos that is increasingly dominant in the Sahelian countries themselves. Um, but that feels like it is best done given the agitating of Wagner and the impredictability of the politics. I mean, if you, you think about it, there's been a, an attempted coup in Chad, coup in Guinea, coup in uh, Mali, a coup in Burkina Faso. You know, this is... You know, we, in the Arab Spring, we were, this, was, this had become a thing when there was a sort of run of coups all the way along North Africa. Actually, in the Sahel, there has been a, a run of coups and yet passes without note almost internationally. To my point about South blindness, you know, we're in a period of massive instability in a region that is Europe's southern flank, effectively, and no one's talking about it. Minister, I want to give you a chance to move some parting thoughts for our audience. So I think the topic of Southern blindness is a really great framing of some of the challenges we've talked about today. But I want to just give you a chance, if you want to just reiterate, or leave your, this, this audience with some key messages from you, Minister. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come and speak. And I'm uh, and, uh, grateful to those of you who have been able to bear with this rather sort of uh, boring, unstructured rant from some random British minister. Um, but I, uh, this is the, the, the game of chess that we're now in. We are now back into an age of systemic competition. And that it requires 
us to relearn what we knew to be self-evident 30 or 40 years ago, that there is not a day that passes where our interest is not being challenged somewhere. And actually now I think that there's not a day that passes where our interest is not being challenged in a lot of places. And that requires us to organize ourselves, to burden share, to stand up as an alliance, to recognize that, the, 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 that we may not have exactly the right answer, that this is a contested space, that, that the Chinese view of how government should work can be quite attractive yeah. to an awful lot of countries. Um, that the Chinese willingness to uh, export defense materials, the China and the Russian uh, willingness to do likewise, that the Chinese ability to lend money almost with no questions asked, buy now, pay when you feel like it, other than it's not like that because when you don't pay, you lose the thing that they built for you. That, that we have to have an answer to that. We can't just turn around and say, don't do it. We can't just say, beware, beware, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a false and, promise. And, and I've seen my government in various iterations try that as the policy and it doesn't work. Why should they listen? Why you know, should I mean, they listen? I, I, just, I, 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 you know, I, th I thought the response in Bamako was not unreasonable. I was there saying, do not do the deal with Wagner. You are, you'll be wasting your money. They're not going to do what they say they do. Look at Mozambique where they really screwed it up. Uh, and, and they're gonna, it's just going to cost you a lot of money. They're going to try and sell you stuff you don't need. And, instead, and at the moment, you've got a partner in France and all of the European countries that come with them that do all of this for no financial return. They just do it because you're a partner and they care about your security and the impact on their interests. But they did it anyway. And they did it because they, were, they felt that their survival as a government depended on them doing it. They felt that their survival as a country depended on it. They thought the country would fracture into tribal areas. And Wagner gave them an answer that was seductive. So we can't, we can't rest on our laurels. We can't assume that all we have to do is turn up and say, hi, I'm from the American Embassy and I'm here to tell you how it is. Or I'm here from the British government and I'm here to... That's just not the way the world works now. We've got to compete actively, day in, day out, with a better offer, a better set of values. Get them to join our club because we stand for something that they want to be a part of and it works for them. That, I think, is what we need to be doing. Minister, this has been great. I've been waiting to have a conversation like this for a long time. This is fantastic. Thank Please you. come back anytime. Oh, I'd love to. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank Minister. Great. Thank you.